everybody. Um, it's 11.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Wildfire Risk Mitigation Session. Um, Jenny Co and Jason McMillan are with us, both from DNR, and we're going to watch a 40-minute video and then have time for live Q&A with them. Hello, uh, my name is Jenny Co. I work for the Department of Natural Resources in Washington State. And uh, my position is with the wildfire division. I'm the community wildfire resilience coordinator uh, and I cover Western Washington. So uh, we are here today to talk about wildfire risk in Western Washington, which is a little bit of a unique topic. I know that um, a lot of us are used to hearing about wildfire on a regular basis uh, in Eastern Washington and California and a lot of other parts of the West. Uh, but wildfire risk in Western Washington is something that is getting a little bit more attention these days. And I think it's really important to talk about what you can do as a forest landowner and a homeowner to help protect your property um, in the event of a wildfire. Because we do know uh, through recent research that wildfire risk is increasing in Western Washington. Okay, so I mentioned that we know that wildfire risk is increasing in Western Washington, and there's been a lot of research done um, on the reasons why risk is increasing in Western Washington. So I wanted to point out a few factors that are um, leading to this. So the first one is that we are having increased air temperatures. We are also experiencing less rain in the summer, and our snow is melting earlier, which basically means there's less water available for a shorter amount of time into the season. So all of these three factors are, are essentially leading to drier fuels or vegetation and drier forests. And when we have those conditions, they're more conducive to wildfire. So the important thing to note is that you still need an ignition source to have a fire, right? And we do have one other weather factor that tends to result in the larger, more extreme wildfires in Western Washington. And that weather event is the east winds in the summertime. So what happens is hot, dry winds from Eastern Washington come over the Cascades and uh, basically dry everything out really quickly and get a good force of wind going. And so um, it just inc really increases the risk of a fire getting going and actually spreading rapidly enough to cause damage. So we actually are just um, experiencing that this summer slash, I guess, fall, we're in fall now, um, with the Bolt Creek fire, which is out of index, and the Goat Rock fire down near Packwood. And those were basically fueled by an east wind event that happened earlier September um, that pushed those fires and helped them grow really large. So we are currently seeing large fires in Western Washington right now. And I think it's, um, I think it's really good evidence that, you know, as residents in Western Washington, that we really start to think about what we can do on our property to reduce wildfire risk. So one of the main reasons uh, that cause homes to burn down in wildfires is actually from embers. It is not a large wall of flame that, uh, you know, takes your house out. Um, it is actually the small things um, like the embers that tend to get trapped in places where you don't see them or there are um, other types of debris collecting in those small places where the embers land and they smolder and they ignite and can go unnoticed and burn homes down. So I want to talk about um, when, we're, when we're looking at wildfire risk to homes and we're looking at the things that we can do to protect the home we're really keeping in mind where embers can land and what kind of effect they would have. So we're gonna focus on embers today as we walk around and look at a home here that we have in Colony Mountain Community. And I'm gonna start pointing out a few things um, that I notice about this particular home that are either a good thing for wildfire risk reduction or maybe something that can be improved. So uh, when we're looking at how to reduce wildfire risk to a home, we've, science has shown that the area we want to focus on actually is the home itself and then 
the area around it out to 100 feet, potentially 200 feet if your home is on a slope. And there's a term for that area, it's called the home ignition zone. So what we're looking at here at this house is we're gonna start by assessing the roof and we're gonna work our way down the house and, and assess everything from the house, the structure itself, and then out within that home ignition zone. And I'll talk about different aspects of the building itself and the landscaping and the forested area as far as how to reduce wildfire risk around your home. So as far as the roof goes, the ideal roof protection in a wildfire is to have a fire resistant roofing material uh, that is class A rated. So on this roof here, they have um, composition shingle, which is a great fire resistant roof as long as it is in good condition and as long as it doesn't have a lot of debris collecting on it. So what happens is um, in roof valleys and where the different roof lines meet, those are areas where debris tends to collect. Um, and you can see with this roof, this part of the roof right here, it's mostly clean, but you can see in the valleys here in this corner, there's a little bit of debris that's collected. It's not too bad, actually. They've done a pretty good job of, of keeping the roof clean. But that debris tends to collect in those cracks, and it also collects in gutters. And you can see in this corner right here, some leaves sticking out of the gutters. So as a homeowner, it's really important to make sure that you keep your roof clean and you remove those we call what we call fine fuels because those are the gutters and those cracks and crevices are the same places that those embers collect that we talked about before. If the wind is blowing, embers can get picked up, they'll get trapped in those places and that stuff is really ignitable. So it can smolder, it can catch leaves or debris in the gutter on fire and, and allow that fire to spread to the roof edge or the trim. Um, and so just the maintenance of the roof is actually a really important thing that you can do to reduce the risk of fire damaging your home. So cleaning out the gutters, cleaning off the roof, making sure there's no um, shingles that are lifting up or any damage to your roof where fire could get underneath the roof covering to the wood structure um, is a really important aspect of reducing wildfire risk to your home. So looking at this house, we're, we're assessing the siding and this house has cedar siding. Uh, there are shakes on the top and uh, paneling on the bottom. And wood siding is very common in Western Washington on a lot of houses. Um, we do know that it's flammable. So when you have wood siding like this, the important thing to remember is what you have up against your siding that might be flammable that can spread fire to your siding. So in a case where you have wood siding like this, you want to make sure that you don't have a lot of flammable vegetation right up against it or firewood or anything that can catch fire right up against your siding. Um, in this case, you can see that this homeowner has rock at the base, which is which is helpful, but they also have you know some plants right up next to their house and in some other areas they do as well. So it's just a it's a it's almost like the relationship of what it what your siding is and what you have next to it is really important. Now if this homeowner had um, you know like the concrete composite siding like the hardy plank type siding that would be a little bit different there'd be a little bit more wiggle room as to what could be right up next to the house because that siding is fire resistant. So it's really important to think about that relationship. Okay, so the next, um, the next area we wanna focus on for the house and within that home ignition zone is the first five feet around the perimeter of the house. And that's actually a really important area to focus on when you are reducing your wildfire risk. So we focus on the structure itself and then we're looking at that first five feet around it because a lot of times what you have within that first five feet can make a difference as to whether fire can spread to your home. So in this case, this is a really good example of what you would want your first five feet to look like. Um, and this homeowner has put rock within the first three to five feet around his home. Um, this is a great, what we call fuel break. So if embers land in these rocks, they're not gonna burn anything. Um, and it goes right up to the side of the house. What I do wanna point out in this situation though, is while this homeowner has done a great job of putting a non-flammable zone in that first three to five feet. 
he does have some items that are flammable right up next to his house. For example, this propane tank and um, these camping chairs. And while, you know, in the winter time and, you know, early spring, it may not be that big of a deal. In the summertime, if the homeowner isn't here, they leave for a vacation or something for a week and there's a fire, this is the stuff that's gonna catch the embers and ignite and it's right up next to this wood siding. So, so we want this five foot zone to be a non-flammable zone. So the rock is great, but keeping things that are flammable in this area is not a good idea. Um, and that includes plants. So if you follow me over here, I will show you some other areas within this zero to five foot zone. So this is the back patio here, and you can see that this is uh, concrete, I think, and he's also got this nice concrete patio that stretches out about 30 feet that direction. Um, this is all non-flammable area right up next to the house. So that's a really good example of uh, an area that is not gonna be able to carry fire. Um, but if you come this way, can see that on this side of the house, um, this is a very common scenario in Western Washington and in a lot of places really, is to put plants and landscaping right up next to the house because it's beautiful, it adds color and, and interest to, to your home. Um, however, this is that ideally non-flammable zone where you don't have any plants and you don't have anything flammable. So while this looks nice, um, in, in a wildfire, this is an area that could actually spread fire to the siding, which is wood. So, um, so this this idea of you know non-flammable materials right up in this five foot zone can really make a big difference to protect your home in a wildfire. Okay, so we've talked about zone one, which is the zero to five feet out from the house, and how we want that to be a non-flammable zone. And then working out from there, zone two is five to 30 feet from the house. And that's really um, the sort of the more defensible space area where um, we're looking at um, having sort of breaks in the landscape where you don't have a lot of dense vegetation that leads right up to the house. Um, you can have plants in this area. You can have um, trees in this area as long as they are uh, maintained and there are uh, separation between the vegetation with things like lawn um, can actually act as a great fuel break in the five to 30 foot zone, um, as long as it's kept short. So I know that in the summertime, a lot of times, you know, there are watering restrictions and, and people aren't, don't wanna keep their lawns green um, because it's not, you know, good for water conservation, but so your lawn doesn't necessarily have to be green, but as long as it's kept short, like three inches or, or lower, um, it really does act as a really great uh, fuel break. So if embers land in the grass, they're gonna just smolder a little bit and die out and not be able to carry to the house. Um, when we're looking at more of a landscape area in the five to 30 foot zone, you know, kind of this area over here, um, you know, there, this homeowner has some low growing vegetation. Uh, there's a rock path that kind of separates some of that landscaping that also acts as a fuel break. This patio that we're standing on is part of the 30 foot zone. This as well, if land, embers land on here, as I mentioned before, they're not gonna burn anything or spread. Um, so really in this zone, we're, we're looking at creating some of that horizontal separation on the surface of the ground so that fire can't spread from out here to the house. But we're also looking at areas where um, fire would be able to spread from the ground up into a larger tree. So we're looking at the we're looking at the horizontal separation, but we're also looking at creating some of that vertical separation where um, we're reducing the ability for fire to carry from vegetation on the ground up into these larger trees. So for example, right here, we've got the patio, it's non-flammable. We've got a little bit of lawn that also acts as a fuel break. And then we have this large cedar tree right here. 
And so right now, there's, in, in, at least in this area right here, there's not a lot of dense vegetation that leads right up into these uh, tree branches. If there was, um, those, that's something that we would want to remove. Those are called the ladder fuels. So whether it's pruning up the lower branches of the tree higher to get that separation, or removing some of that underbrush to create that separation, it just kind of depends on what makes the most sense. And for this particular tree right here, the homeowner has done some limbing to get those tree limbs higher off the ground so we don't have those ladder fuels. Now, we're looking at this spot right here, but in some of the other spots we can see, like back in here a little bit farther, some of these tree branches come down lower. And so there's more of a ladder fuel situation here where you've got, you know, ferns and you know, a lot of accumulation of dead stuff on the ground that can really act as a ladder to carry fire up into these uh, cedar trees. So again, within this zone, we're talking about breaking up those continuous fuels so fire can't spread from on the ground from out here to the structure, as well as breaking up those vertical fuels so that fire can't spread from the ground up into the larger trees. Because one of the things we want to keep in mind about fire is that we're not necessarily trying to exclude it from the landscape. Fire is part of our natural ecology and it does it serves a lot of purpose when it is a low intensity fire. So what we're really trying to do is keep it from spreading um, out of control from torching trees, causing embers to land on the house, things like that. So, and it's much more manageable when it's on the ground. Um, is the other thing. Once a fire is able to carry up into the larger trees, it becomes a much different ball game for firefighters and a much more dangerous scenario. So we're really trying to break up that ability for fire to spread to your structure. So if you keep those concepts in mind, um, you know, hardening your home, which is using fire resistant materials, um, keeping that zero to five foot zone one, a non flammable zone, and then working with your landscaping to incorporate those fuel breaks like the short lawn or a rock pathway. And then, you know, um, getting rid of those ladder fuels. Those are really the main concepts to keep in mind when you are trying to protect your home from wildfire. So what I like to tell people is, cause a lot of this stuff can be overwhelming when you start thinking about it all at the same time. So one of the best things to do, I think, is to step outside your front door look at your structure and start with the first, you know, five feet within your home, you know, when you're looking at wildfire risk, one step at a time. Um, and a lot of these things are just kind of end up being regular maintenance things that you might be doing anyway, like cleaning leaves and cleaning out your gutters off, or excuse me, cleaning leaves off your roof and cleaning out your gutters. So um, I don't want, I don't want folks, homeowners to get overwhelmed by all the things that can be done and just start closest to your home and work out from there. One of the things I want to point out about this patio is, um, is the patio furniture. And while this patio is a really great fuel break, um, the, the patio furniture can often cause problems in a wildfire. So while there's a, there is a lot of patio furniture out here, it's a large area, but if you know that you are um, going out of town in the summertime, and you're gonna be gone for a few days or a week or a couple weeks, whatever it is, and it's at the height of summer, sometimes it can be a really good idea to take that patio furniture that could ignite or spread fire to the house and just move it into the garage or move it inside the house somewhere so it doesn't serve as a, another fuel item to spread the fire to your house. Um, because we do see in a lot of in a lot of instances where fire has spread to a house, it has been because of you know wood chair or you know a, a flammable table that's been close enough to the house to catch on fire and spread that spread that fire to the structure. So just moving that stuff somewhere safe inside the garage, inside the house, if you know you're going to be gone, can also be really beneficial when it comes to protecting your home from igniting. One of the things to keep in mind when you're looking at your yard or your landscaping is to incorporate fire resistant 
plants into, into your landscaping. And a lot of our native plants are really actually very fire resistant. Um, I do want to point out that there's a couple very common landscaping plants that people have used in their yard uh, that are actually very flammable. One of those is arborvitae. Those are the ones that are kind of cone shaped um, and people use them typically for view screens between them and their neighbors because they grow really fast and they fill in and kind of make a wall. And a lot of times those are right up next to the house and those are highly flammable plants. So if you can avoid using those, putting them in your yard, that's a good thing. Or if you have them, uh, taking them out. The other common uh, landscaping plant that's very flammable is juniper and as well as uh, cypress. So both of those uh, species in different forms are, are very common landscape plants, uh, but they are both very flammable. And the reason is because they have a lot of oil content in them and they are the vegetation formation is very dense. So they tend to get a lot of dead stuff in the middle. If you were to look inside of a juniper bush or pull back a arborvitae and look inside, you would see a ton of dead stuff in there. So those two plants are, are highly flammable and you don't wanna have them within you know 30 feet of your structure if you can avoid it. Um, but back to the fire resistant plants, they tend to be have less oil content. Um, they tend to be smaller in structure and our native plants are actually, you know, they're, they're adjusted to this area. They're adjusted to these conditions. So they tend to thrive a little bit better and a thriving plant is always gonna be a little bit more fire resistant than one that's suffering from drought um, or is stressed. So um, figuring out ways to incorporate native fire resistant vegetation into your landscape can be really beneficial as well because you really don't have to have a moonscape and a bunch of concrete and rock around your yard to be fire resistant. You can have beautiful plants it's just about creating that separation, making sure you're choosing more fire resistant plants and not having that continuous vegetation right up to your structure. There are some really good resources available uh, on fire resistant plants that we can talk about in the live session and hopefully we can share some of the links to some of those resources. Um, a lot of them will focus on native vegetation and uh, share, you know, if you're trying to attract pollinators or wildlife or you want to know if a plant is deer resistant it has a lot of that information in it too because we realize in a lot of cases as homeowners and landowners you're not just thinking about wildfire resilience you're also thinking about you know all these other important factors in your yard whether it's you know wildlife or pollinators or whatever it is um, you know beautification and color all those things are important so there are ways to achieve all of those things and still have a fire resistant landscape hi uh, my name is jason mcmillan i'm the assistant fire manager for the salish fire unit uh, here in the department of natural resources for washington state i've been fighting wildland fire for uh, 30 years uh, mainly in the Pacific Northwest, um, as well as other parts of the country. And in my career in Western Washington fighting fire, I've noticed that uh, fire um, has, been, has been evolving and changing over my career. Uh, fires are, are getting larger and more frequent than when I started back in the 1990s. Uh, and this is due to uh, several different factors. Uh, obviously more people are out on the landscape, so there's more potential for fires to start. Uh, when I first started fighting fire, we were told that 90% of fires were started by lightning and only 10% were started by people. And now you can just flip those numbers and 90% of our fires are started by people and 10% are started by lightning. Uh, and so that's a huge factor and, and fires in Western Washington, just having more folks on the ground. The other uh, factor that we're seeing is, is a changing climate. We're getting a, a longer fire season. Fires are starting earlier in the year. Uh, fire season's going later into the year, like this year, for example. Uh, it's late September and we're still seeing, you know, red flag warnings, uh, fire weather watches, et cetera. Um, and the Bolt Creek fire, which uh, started September 10th, uh, 
burn 10,000 acres in under eight hours. And, and it's one of those events where everything lined up. We had an ignition source. Uh, we had a red flag warning event, which was an east wind event with low relative humidity, high winds, and just blew down that Skykomish Valley, uh, threatening the communities of Grotto, Bering, and Index. And so when folks say that we never have large fires in Western Washington, uh, that there's, you know, fire intensity is low in Western Washington, those are fallacies. And, and honestly, we do have the potential to have large fires in, in that wildland urban interface and wildland urban intermix are most firefighters biggest concern just because of the, the communities that are in in that wildland environment so what we've been discussing is how homeowners and property owners can make their properties more resilient to fire and and help us as firefighters when we come into the community we know that the community has prepared for the fire they've constructed their homes out of the materials that are fire resistant they've uh, address the home ignition zone uh, around their home and the intermediate zone out to the extended zone. Uh, and for us as firefighters, when we come in to that community, we can focus on fighting the fire and not necessarily having to focus on protecting the structures. So, uh, you know, forest, forest health and resiliency and also firewise communities are, are great tools for uh, people to be using um, we were fighting the Bolt Creek fire and we were noticing that in these communities, the fire was still several hundred feet away from the communities and, and ember showers and, you know, were raining down into this community. And so the importance of, of keeping, you know, your gutters clean, clean of flammable debris, anything in that home ignition zone is, is so critical because these embers and fire brands are actually uh, spotting out ahead of the fire. And so it's not the flaming front that comes through and, and burns people's homes down. It's these embers and fire brands that are landing like rain. Uh, and they're starting smaller fires out ahead of the main large fire. And, and most homes that are, are damaged or destroyed by wildland fire, that's the, how they're destroyed is, is from those embers landing in areas that haven't been cleaned um, in gutters, valleys and in, in, inside your uh, on your roof. Um, if your vents aren't covered correctly, anywhere that the embers can land and start a fire, that's um, what you need to clean as a homeowner. Uh, we are here talking to Chris England, who is a homeowner in the Colony Mountain community. And I wanted to ask him a few questions about uh, being a resident in a Firewise community and give him a chance to talk about some of the things that he's been concerned about regarding wildfire and some of the things he's done maybe around his home or his property that he might want to highlight as far as uh, protecting his home from wildfire. So Chris, yeah. my first question is, um, what? why is this community or why are you as a homeowner in this community concerned about wildfire? Well, because we live in the middle of a very dense forest that hasn't been managed um, since the 70s in any, in any meaningful way. Um, so there's 420 some acres, there's 80 homes, and um, a lot of thick uh, material on the ground and, and standing as well. So um, we haven't had a fire in here since I've been here in 25 years. Um, I know from walking around in the forest that there are, there are um, groups of standing dead trees. There's a lot of, there's some logging slash that's still on the ground. And we know that those kinds of fuels can carry a fire really aggressively and not only take out the forest, but take out the homes as well. So Chris, as a homeowner in Colony Mountain community where, where we know there's some wildfire risk, are there things that you have done around your property maybe to your home or to the landscaping or the more forested area um, that you think have reduced the risk to damage or destruction to your property? We've made an attempt for sure. Um, 
when we built the house, we didn't consider fire resistance whatsoever. Um, we built with the way we could afford to build it. Sure. And so, you know, we don't, ha we don't have a cedar roof or anything. We have a, um, a fire resistive roof, um, but we have some cedar on the side of the house. Um, so it wasn't in our mind when we were building the house. Mm -hmm. But since then, um, we've been careful. For instance, um, we do heat our home partially with firewood. And rather than have the firewood near the house, we have a whole shed that's, you know, 50 feet away. So, yeah. you know, if fire comes through, it'll burn there and not, not catch the house on fire. Um, you know, we keep the gutters clear. We keep most of the plantings away from the home. Most mm -hmm. of the home has gravel or other hard surface or, around near the foundation. Um, so, you know, those things were, were done in mindfully of, of wildfire. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, we have spent some time removing excessive fuels within a couple hundred feet of the house. Okay. Um, and then a few years ago, we actually built an access road, which I maintain kind of as a fire road. Okay. About, well, it varies in distance to the house, but mm -hmm. essentially down to the bottom of the topography. Um, and from inside of that, in other words, from, from between that road and the house, I try to keep the fuels down. When I have deadfall, I clear it out. Um, once a year, I go through and I'll rake out excessive material that's in there, um, keep the trees limbed up and that sort of thing. Great. Sounds like a lot of good work that's been done. I'm wondering if we could take a little walk down that trail to check it out. Sure. Okay, great. Let's do that. Okay. So Chris, um, can you tell us like what kind of activities you're doing in the area between this road and the house? Well, um, limbing up and eliminating those ladder fuels. Okay. Uh, removing deadfall. Um, and there was an accumulation of just old semi-rotten trees that were, that were laying down in this space that I've removed. Okay. Um, there was quite a few more trees. Um, uh, this hillside was a lot more dense We've, we've taken those out too. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what that hillside looked like before I cleaned it up. And that's hip deep tops, dead tops and, and limbs and old trees that have just fallen over. And I, you know, it's, it's just a little bit too much for some people to be able to deal with. And including myself, I, I could do this much, but. Yeah, almost, yeah. That's, that's just a, and a lot of that is like hemlock tops and those things are like gasoline. So anyway. <laughs> well, as, as a homeowner, yeah. I think, you know, we, when we're talking about reducing risk to structures, we're really looking at, you know, the first 30 to a hundred feet out. If your pro if your property is flat, your property is not. So we're looking at, you know, doing work out to around 200 feet or so. Mm -hmm. So you've, that's really what you've been focusing on, you yeah. know, within this zone here, um, below your house and in between this road that's, that's cut through here. So I think, I think you are really focusing in the areas that are most important right now. Um, as far as like protecting your structure and, and the things that are most valuable to you. You've really, disperse the fuels that were here um, but it's still aesthetically pleasing and so from a fire you know from a firefighter's perspective uh, this is great you know you're definitely what you've done here is going to change the fire behavior the fire behavior that you, you get here is going to be low intensity nothing torching close to your home yeah uh, so this extended this extended zone away from your home um, looks really great and actually, you know, when you start opening up around your house, bringing in, uh, reducing the density and bringing in a little more light, you realize, actually, this, this feels pretty good. Let's, maybe we can expand this out a little bit more, give ourselves a little more protection and enjoy the forest views a little bit more. Because when it's so thick, you can't see through it. It doesn't matter what's on the other side of those trees. You can't see them anyway. But if you open it up a little bit, you get to enjoy the forest a little bit more. When communities can actually take the, the time and do this type of work to help themselves and to help us as firefighters, because uh, we know that 
once the fire gets into this community that the, the intensity is going to die down, the fire behavior is going to change and it's gonna change in a way that's advantageous for us as firefighters. So one of the things I wanted to point out um, about wildfire and preparedness is the importance of working with your neighbors. And the reason for that is because a lot of times when we're talking about a home ignition zone, like I've been talking about, um, that zone really is then on your neighbor's property a lot of times. And so working together with your neighbors can make a big difference in reducing the risk, not just to your individual property, but to your neighbor's property and to the community as a whole. Um, and, and the idea of neighbors working together can really um, expand the impact of, of the preparedness work that happens within a community. So one of the, one of the great programs that's available for communities to really understand their wildfire risk and do something about it, some, take some action, is the Firewise USA program. And this is a, uh, this is a national recognition program for communities and it provides a framework for community and neighbors working together to follow um, a path of understanding their wildfire risk getting connected to wildfire experts, and then actually planning to, um, planning what they would like to do as a community to reduce their risk and following through on those actions. So um, this is a national program, like I said, and there are, I think, probably 1,500 Firewise communities around the nation. I don't remember how many there are in Washington State right now. But Chris is in Colony Mountain Community, which is a Firewise community since 2018. And so, Chris, I want to ask you, as a member of this community, um, what do you think some of the benefits are to Colony Mountain in participating in the Firewise program? Well, I think the main benefit is that everybody who owns property up here and lives up here is educated about what is likely going to happen to their house in the event of a wildfire if they don't do those things that are suggested by the wild firewise program mm -hmm. and so i used to lay in bed at night thinking and i knew very very well because i was in the fire service and and uh and i've also lived in the mountains most of my life i knew very well what could occur but i didn't know if my neighbors were aware mm -hmm. i think that they might have felt and i think some of them did feel before the Firewise program that the fire department was gonna come in and save their lives and save their home and everything would be just dandy. Um, but I knew better that that was not gonna be the, the case. And so um, we built the Firewise program here and got all that information already ready to go. You don't have to invent it. Um, it the publications are great. The information is really helpful. And then people can decide whether or not they wanna do those kinds of things to get their house and their property ready. Yeah, so the, the Fireways program is, it's all voluntary and a community can participate knowing that not every single homeowner within that community is going to take steps, but it, it is really, it's really, it's not an endpoint, it's more like a process. So a Fireways community might have, um, you know, 300 people in it and 50 of those people are actively taking actions to reduce risk. But one of the action items that the community has identified in that Firewise process is to educate more of those homeowners within the community so they have a better understanding of what they can do and you know, show them what a fire resistant landscape looks like or you know, uh, help neighbors that may be senior or disabled or, or folks that can't do some of this work themselves you know, working together as a neighborhood is one way to get help to those folks as well. So, so there's, I think there's a lot of different ways you can go um, being a Firewise community to do well for preparedness. And it's really designed to, for the community to identify what types of activities work best for them. And it is an, it's an ongoing process. So every year that community invests a certain amount of time and energy and, and sometimes money into the community to start working on those, taking those actions, working on the things that they've identified our priority and renew their uh, participation in the program every year. So, um, so it's great to see that what Colony Mountain, 
Colony Mountain community has done over the last few years. And I know that as um, one of the leaders in the community with Firewise, that you guys, you and, and some of your neighbors and some other folks have ideas about what other things can be done as the years go on. And um, Chris has been, you know, working with some of the forestry experts and some of the wildfire experts at the at DNR and the conservation district to start figuring out, hey, what are, how can we make some of these things happen? And that right now there's a lot of resources available to communities to, to help them do some of these things. So, um, so it's a, it's, it's a really great program to get folks thinking about this stuff and, and to connect them to resources that might be available to help them actually take some of those actions. So there are a number of resources available for landowners to um, learn about wildfire risk and wildfire risk reduction actions and actually talk to a professional, um, whether it's uh, regarding having a wildfire risk assessment of your property or a forest health assessment. There's a ton of resources available. So um, you can contact your local conservation district. You can contact your region uh, DNR office who will have a forest stewardship staff um, that can come out and help you. Um, there's also uh, the Firewise website has a ton of really great informational resources on it and of course information about the Firewise program itself. That's just at uh, firewise.org. Um, and then at any point you're welcome to reach out and contact me directly. I think my contact information will be on the screen. Um, but again, my name is Jenny and I'm the Resilience Coordinator for Western Washington for DNR and I'm happy to answer questions and uh, answer phone calls uh, about whatever wildfire resilience questions you have. All right. Thanks so much, Jenny and Jason. That was a really informative video. Um, it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, first one, what is flammability quotient of cedar trimmed or blue spruce? Jenny, do you want to cover that? Yeah, and yeah. Um, Jason can weigh in if he's seen something in his experience fighting fire, but um, so I'm not super familiar with blue spruce because I'm typically focused on more of the native vegetation. Um, I know blue spruce can have uh, disease issues and any, um, really any type of vegetation, even if it's considered uh, uh, a more fire resistant type plant, um, can be more flammable if it is stressed, um, if it's not getting enough water, if it has disease issues. So um, a healthy blue spruce, I think, is relatively fire resistant. Um, but Jason, if you if I'm if you had different experience with that, um, let, you can jump in on that. Um, as far as western red cedar, I'm not sure what you mean exactly by trimmed. Maybe you mean pruned up. Um, western red cedar, in particular, is one of our more flammable native plants we have around here. Um, however, you know, it's, it's one of our iconic conifers uh, in Western Washington and lots of people love them and have them in their uh, landscapes and in their forests. And so my recommendation for cedars, if you, if you want to keep them on your property, uh, that's fine. You just want to make sure that um, those branches, which are particularly flammable, are pruned up um, above the lower vegetation with a good six to 10 feet of space or a good six to 10 feet of space of the closest branches to your roof or your siding of your house. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I know there was another question uh, right after that about fire resistant plants resources and I put a link in there for you guys to access the resource that I um, typically use. Unfortunately, right now there isn't like the resource I listed in there is for Washington, Oregon, and I think Idaho as well. 
Um, and there is a very specific resource that is for Eastern Washington uh, for, for fire resistant plants, but uh, there hasn't been one developed for Western Washington in particular, if that's where you're coming from. That is something that I am hoping to work on and see in the, in the future. Um, but right now the link that I provided is probably the best resource for fire resistant plants. Great, thanks for sharing that, Jenny. Um, we have a comment that, um, Jenny, you did a great job addressing in the chat, but maybe you could just speak a little bit more about it. Um, a, a, a participant says, this is really depressing. I chose to live in Western Washington. I don't want to clear it all, so I live in faux Eastern Washington. Um, I want that downed wood for wildlife habitat. Could you just um, either Jason or Jenny expand a little bit on, on how you can manage your uh, land to keep it Western Washington-ish, but minimize fire risk? Yeah, so I think that's where, um, and that's, thank you for sharing that comment, Roberta, that is something we've heard um, from other folks uh, before. Um, and as we know, Western Washington, everything grows and it grows quick and it's pretty lush over here. Um, so we are certainly not um, recommending you having to clear all the trees from your property. It is more a focus on, as I mentioned in the video, that your structure itself, doing that, those home hardening type of activities. Um, and then, you know, focusing first on the, on the first five feet around your structure and then working out from there. And so it's a very, it's pretty rare that if I'm doing a wildfire risk assessment for somebody that I am recommending them cutting down trees. Um, it's more of limbing trees up, removing those ladder fields we talked about in the video um, and creating some of those breaks in the fuel on the landscape so that there isn't a you know continuous path of vegetation right up to your structure that will allow fire to spread to it. Um, so hopefully that message is getting across. Um, and Roberta, feel free to reach out to, to myself or Jason if you have any questions, um, more questions, more specific questions about that. Um, we do recognize that the value of uh, wildlife piles um, and down wood and things like that for building soil and all the other things it does. And sometimes it's just a matter of where that's happening um, in relation to your structures and your um, and wildfire risk. So the other thing I just want to point out really quickly is, you know, there are different levels of risk aversion um, and there's different levels of risk depending on where you live. So some of these activities might be more prudent, depending on where you live, and some of them might be a little bit less of a, I mean, you can always do the home hardening, but the fuel mitigation, the fuel um, management piece, um, sometimes that isn't your priority and, and that's okay. You just know that you're taking some level of risk depending on where you live. So Jason, I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that. Uh, you know, that's a very complex uh, issue, right? Changing the, f the fuel types in, in Western Washington. We know that, you know, when you take the timber away, then the timber was shading the understory. And so you're allowing more light into the understory, which is going to allow more brush to grow. And so it, it is a, um, a very hard question to have the right answer to. So I, I honestly feel that just having awareness of of wildfire potential, wildfire risk um, is, is half the battle, right? Just knowing what the potential is and then you manage your forest appropriately and how you want to manage your forest. And, and I get it, we live in Western Washington for a reason. We love the lush, the green, the, the beauty of where we live. So, um, you know, these are just, these are just ways and tools that we're providing for folks, but by no means are we asking, you to to go in and and um, you know doing anything that you're not comfortable doing on on your landscape or your property. So great, thanks for answering that. Um, we have a question in the Q and A. What roof vents need to be covered and how? Just trying to find my unmute button there. Um, so that actually, uh, that's a great question because um, that is something important that didn't get captured in the video. Um, I probably was doing something <laughs> like weird or dorky when I was filming that part of it. So you had to cut it out. 
So that's actually a great setup because I was going to share this anyway. Um, so vent screening is a really important aspect of home hardening because it can help keep embers out from getting into crawl spaces and into attics and you know um, through roofs. And so um, it's also one of the least expensive fixes you can do on your home that makes a big difference. So what we're looking for is um, eighth of an inch metal mesh screening to go on those vents, um, all of them really, except for uh, you don't wanna put it on your dryer vent because that just captures lint. Um, so if you, and you don't necessarily have to replace the ones that are there, you can actually put um, the eighth inch screening over the existing ones if that's easier, because I know sometimes it's challenging to get the existing ones out. So crawl space vents, attic vents, roof vents, anywhere um, where you have a vent except for your dryer vent, you can put that eighth inch metal mesh screening on and that will, that will keep embers out that are big enough to actually do damage. So I hope that answers the question. Yep. Jason put that in the chat as well. And I know um, like I've went, I've gone looking for that and they sell it in rolls and sheets at, um, at least in my area, which is up in Bellingham um, at hardware sales. So I'm sure that's something you can find anywhere and get whatever size roll you need. Great. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, anybody has a question, put it in the chat now. Um, but otherwise, Jenny and Jason have both put their emails in the chat and you can reach out to them if any questions come up. Um, and thanks so much for being here, Jenny and Jason. Very informative. Really appreciate it.